absolutely massive news roundup today, guys. Something for everyone in today's video. Kicking it off with a tweet from PlayStation Brazil, who were tweeting out a old interview that they had with the Overwatch 2 developers. But in the tweet, they may have accidentally dropped a big one. And shout out to Grip on Twitter, tipping us off to this story and translating for us, saying 2020 will be the year Overwatch 2 comes to PS4. And to prepare for it, we talked to some of the developers who gave us new information. whoops a daisy Now the tweet had since been deleted, but the damage has already been done. Are PlayStation and the consoles already aware of the release date of Overwatch, or was this just a flat out mistake? Well, if I take you all the way back to the pre-BlizzCon leaks that we covered, Metro had leaked tons of things about Overwatch 2, all of which came to be true, except for one thing. He said that according to his information, the development team was working as hard as they could to release Overwatch in 2020. But when it came to BlizzCon, Jeff Kaplan and the developers stated that we very likely would still be seeing news about Overwatch 2 next year's BlizzCon, implying at best that it release at the end of the year, if not in 2021, which seems a little bit fishy. Why would all of the other leaks be true, but this one be so grossly inaccurate. Well, to be fair, development is a very fluid thing and release dates have to change. So perhaps the devs were announcing a very loose release window so that we would be pleasantly surprised if they were able to make it earlier. But internally, we're really trying to get it out in 2020. I don't know. I'm skeptical with all of this and not sure what to believe because Honestly, last year's BlizzCon, they didn't show us that much of Overwatch 2, and the information we've been getting about its development has been all over the place. Where in one breath, Jeff will answer in an article that they couldn't spare development time for fun things for events, for example, like sprucing up Junkenstein's Revenge to a cool degree because they were working towards the sequel. But that's talking about like last year or before. How long have they been working on Overwatch 2? And if it has been quite a while, you would think they'd be farther along. And honestly, in my opinion, the way Blizzard operates, I'm pretty sure whenever they show anything, it is multiple stages behind where they are internally. This is a pretty common practice because you can safeguard yourself from committing to too much. Because if you show where you are day of, well, a lot of that stuff might change. Whereas if you minimize how much you're willing to show to the core essentials of things that are definitely going to be in the game, that you don't have to let anybody down. But it does make the overall announcement underwhelming, but that's how I think it all pans out. I think there's way more under the hood with Overwatch 2, but some of it is subject to change. Development can come in huge bursts where you could spend years going down a road that you just scrap altogether and change completely overnight. Grip also translated for us from the interview that Aaron Keller said that they did have plans to change competitive mode, but no details on that yet which is something that I'm keeping a close eye on, of course. Next up, Sniper on Reddit was quite the detective on this one, putting two and two together, found an old Jeff Goodman post where he spoke about a bunch of abilities that they worked on internally, but didn't end up using, at least not yet at the time. This one is from March 19th, and it details a bomblet gun, as well as a couple other things, where the weapon would stick low impact projectiles that would require you to finish an animation before they explode. So like a timed sticky bomb. Well, with a keen eye, Sniper was able to look at the Overwatch 2 cinematic and notice that Echo, as she swoops in to save the day, seems to shoot out exactly this weapon giving us a much clearer idea of what the character will play like, covering the enemy in goop and then exploding it later, which could be really strong considering how burst damage works, or if the sticky goo had any other debuff effect. And to be honest, when this trailer first came out, I wasn't looking at it too critically, but maybe we should have been because it does seem like if you follow those breadcrumb trails, there's a pretty clear indication of what the hero is going to be like. So I took another look at the trailer and side note, not going to lie, it did make me cry a little bit. It might be just because I'm a tank player seeing the tank 
stand up for his friends to take the fall confidently in the face of adversity just to get carried when Genji comes in. The power of teamwork, it's such a beautiful thing. If only ranked mode felt that way. Jokes aside, if Echo's gameplay was hinted to in the cinematic, I think there's a chance that this ending team up sequence might be telling us something as well. Up against the boss, which is alike what you're going to play in the PvE co-op content, Reinhardt and Brigida interlock shields, and it's something Brigida says out loud. When I saw this for the first time, I thought, okay, no big deal, it's just a cinematic thing, it's not always representative of the game, but when you start to add up the rest of the things that the team do, you start to wonder how much of this might have gameplay implications, where Mei puts her ultimate into the bomb, Tracer blinks it in, Genji saves her as well, and then they defeat the big monster. Something that might have been revealed here without us realizing is there might be hero-specific interactions for certain team comps in PvE. I hope that's not too much to ask and getting everybody's hopes up for something awesome that doesn't ever come, but when Brigida actually says interlocking shields, I mean, that's a line of dialogue they wrote purposely, right? She could have easily just said, I'm with you, Reinhardt, or something, right? She made it seem like it's a move that they do, and with how crazy and wacky the abilities are getting for the PvE experience, I wonder if there's going to be some, like, duo abilities, sort of like when the Avengers are in a fight scene and they help each other out by Iron Man shooting Captain America's shield to reflect it into the other guy, right? That kind of thing, where there's modifiers based on your team comp. That would be pretty darn awesome, and is the level of depth that I think us as fans are hoping to see with Overwatch 2. And even if my theory here is completely wrong, I think it's more in line with the types of systems they likely would try to create for the sequel. Aaron Keller has already said as much that they're looking to create way more customization systems beyond just modifying Tracer's Pulse Bomb. And if so, that would be really awesome and would take the gameplay to the next level and really give us that wow factor. And just think about it, if there was other RPG systems that let you unlock these special team-up abilities, that could actually be a pretty deep system. Or this cinematic is just saying that you'll be able to use your abilities in conjunction with each other to combo on bosses like we saw already in BlizzCon. It could just be that too. That is how the gameplay felt where you would chain your abilities onto the boss and it might not be any more complex than that. At the same time, they did say that they want it to be like endlessly replayable and I don't see how they can do that without something like this. So we'll just have to wait and see. Moving on to very important current day Overwatch news. Faust on Reddit posted what I thought was a awesome suggestion for Batiste's immortality field that the cooldown should start after it gets destroyed. This would limit how much you can spam it increasing the gap window in between uses because really if you place it in a godly spot that the enemy can't get to and it doesn't get destroyed it gets timed out the cooldown's only 12 seconds not 20 which is a huge gap right now i don't know if they'll implement exactly that but jeff kaplan did hop on to reddit to respond that they're trying out changes to immortality field to make it feel less oppressive he missed the playtest, but he'll ask the crew how it went. So, of course, they're talking about the next PTR patch that's currently in development. We expected one coming in January, so this one may be coming as early as this week, but I would expect they're attempting to get it to go live in time for the Overwatch League, but they never seem to make these cool deadlines I hope they try to shoot for anyway, so why do I get my hopes up? It's very interesting the wording Jeff Kaplan uses here, and they're trying to make MO Field feel less oppressive. Well... With the health points nerf down to 200, I feel like Immortality Field is incredibly weak when it's used inappropriately, which is what I see most players use it as. If you just toss it into the middle of the team fight, it is basically worthless. And I hate to give tips on one of the most annoying mechanics to play against, but for Batiste, you always want to put it around corners. It's just the way math works out. If you can have infinite health, even if it requires you to let a teammate die, if another teammate can have infinite health, well, they can outdo that. That's how strong Immortality Field is. Like, letting someone die out of position while empowering someone else who just simply can't die and likely can just get a kill is a huge play. Whereas I see a lot of players 
feel forced to toss Immortality Field into the mix. And when you do that, all of the counters that should work against it just destroy it immediately. But where it feels like it can't be countered is when you set up the engagements around corners. Now, I bring that up because I really feel it's only at the high level of play where the team is positioning around those engagement types that make it feel oppressive. So what could Jeff Kaplan be doing to direct that? Because otherwise, it's not going to change anything where it does feel oppressive. Like, for example, if they drop the health points again, that doesn't make a difference. If it had 100 health, it wouldn't really matter to the way that these high-level players are playing it, right? They're putting it out of line of sight, so the enemy can't see it anyway. And they're just structuring their engagement to play around it. Kind of similar to how, in the GOATS era, you would use their sustainabilities to only fight in those favorable positions, right? It's the same kind of thing here with just a range damage enabling ability. So I hope they don't put nerfs to it that would make it even worse for the average player who isn't maximizing it and instead are nerfing it for the high level abuse of it, which the cooldown change would definitely knock it down a few pegs and make the pacing of being able to commit onto that team, holding those strong positions a little bit easier, I think. They also could just reduce the radius of it. That would be a huge nerf instantly. It would change all the positions you can put it in. There's a lot they could do. Look for changes on that, hopefully this week. The next news story is quite serious, actually. Really big deal. This was posted on Reddit by Whippet asking the Blizzard dev team to step up and crank out a couple firefighter skins for Roadhog and Junkrat to raise money for the Australian wildfires. They originally did a charity event like this with the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And yes, it is quite a big undertaking to ask them to put in the extra work that's required to orchestrate this whole thing. It isn't just making the skin. It's all the logistics of the extremely slow moving corporation treaties and forms and all sorts of nonsense that you have to wade through just to make something cool like this happen. But I really think Blizzard should go ahead and do this just for so many reasons, right? Let's start off 2020, Blizzard, making it seem like you're a flexible company that's willing to do the right thing, not just when it feels fashionable for you. We had a lot of negative news stories last year. Come on, new year, new you, right? If you don't know, a big part of Australia is on fire. It's one of the scariest, most apocalyptic type things I've ever heard. Horrifying stuff, really. If you want to send support, you can donate to the Red Cross, who's providing disaster relief and recovery. I've met quite a few Australians in my time, and they're a very tough people. Australia is naturally a very dangerous place, just with the wildlife it has. And this is just yet another thing that our Australian brothers and sisters are matched with overcoming. And honestly, it's the kind of thing that's straight out of some Overwatch lore, right? How many times have we seen in the Overwatch universe that a big storm's coming or some natural disaster? I think we'd all like to see the fictional version of Overwatch come to attempt to help save the day, at least in the part that we all can. Moving on to less serious topics now, we're now getting the sequel to the previous video's Overwatch League drama. A whole lot of shakeups. First up, Doa is joining Monte Cristo in leaving the Overwatch League. Now, although Monte explicitly stated that compensation wasn't a reason that he was leaving, Doa seems to imply that it may have been key for him, kicking off a tweet longer with toss a coin to your caster. The Witcher is a pretty darn great show on Netflix, by the way. Give it a chance. In the tweet longer, Doa explains that the League's decision over the last year in terms of creative direction, management, and resistance to input from veteran esports personnel, he felt like it was time for a change. Keep in mind, Doa has 10 years of professional esports experience, so you could see why he would expect his opinions to be valued. He states that he is still aligned with Overwatch League's goals and believes in it as a League, but he felt he needed to part ways. And here's just a cute sidebar. He said, did you know we got scolded for mentioning Fruit Loops on a Disney XD channel broadcast? Apparently, you're only supposed to mention healthy food on channels marketed to kids. I mean, it has fruit in the name. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very Doa thing to say, isn't it? But just like last time, more casters have announced that they will be taking up the reins. Bren announced on Twitter that he and Sideshow would be moving away from the desk and taking up the mantle to be casters. Although this pair isn't as decorated of broadcast professionals like Doa and Monty were, they were casters in the Team Fortress 2 scene back in the day prior to getting into Overwatch. Red and Sideshow were famous for joking around on the desk quite a bit, and 
it'll be interesting to see if they straighten up a bit for casting. It's kind of difficult to be all memes all the time when you're casting a long set that grows kind of tiring. So I would imagine that we would see these guys button up just a bit more. And especially for Sideshow, have the space to really expand on the Overwatch knowledge that he has. Because if you ever see him on podcasts and stuff, very knowledgeable guy, but in the incredibly short desk segments that they've been sort of pushed to the side to, in my opinion anyway, the pair of them haven't really had the chance to show the knowledge they have of the game. So this might be a bigger buff to the casting team than you may have thought. And it might be a two for one whammy because I doubt they'll find as eccentric as a character as Bren for the desk, which means the desk might get a bit more serious moving forward, which I am completely on board for. Alongside that Overwatch casting legend, ZP finally will be making it into the Overwatch League as a caster and will be paired along Jake, who he casted with in the past. Jake made a comment on his Twitch stream saying that he really liked how ZP would set him up for analysis and seemed excited to be working with him. Also, ZP seems to hint that Avast is going to be joining the team as well, but he can't reveal where he'll be placing quite yet. I would venture a guess that Avast would go to the analyst desk. Avast is famous for doing companion streams during the Overwatch League, as well as casting with ZP for NA contenders. He's a huge brain that a lot of the competitive Overwatch community look up to. He's a former pro player as well, and is very good at giving hot takes and bringing that extra bit of critical analysis. A lot of this is looking like a good thing. Like I know we're supposed to feel like Monty and Doa leaving is some big blow to the Overwatch League. And a lot of people are saying that, but I think if you're an actual hardcore Overwatch fan and not just a mainstream news website commenting on all this issue, this might be the best casting team we've ever had actually. And that's no disrespect to Monty and Doa, but in my opinion anyway, and maybe I'm wrong in this, they were incredibly professional, but didn't ever really feel like homegrown Overwatch talent. A lot of these new additions to the team, they're not going to be as good technically as casters and speakers where Monty and Doa are pretty much flawless in their performance and speaking. That's a very difficult thing to do if you've ever tried to do it. So that level of casting might drop down a bit, but I think the passion for the game and sort of the natural feel will actually get a buff with this new casting lineup with so many former pros or long time Overwatch specific talent finally now getting their spot in the league. It was nice to have Puckett, Monty and Doa launch the league despite them all being legends of broadcasting talent. I'm happy to see Overwatch talent moving their way up on their own path to pro finally. I mean, ZP was passed over for what felt like a decade and he's finally getting a spot along with everybody else, right? So this might just be a good thing. Rumors on Reddit noticed that Uber, who is probably Owl's best play-by-play -play caster, removed Overwatch League from his Twitter bio, leading some theorists to believe that he might be leaving Owl as well. But Bren replied on Twitter to him saying that he's had a pint. Get the bag, my son, with three money bags. So somehow I think Uber probably is getting a coin tossed his way, which I don't think any of us would dispute is long overdue as well. Further on this drama with Overwatch League, Monte Cristo and John Spector, who's the director for Overwatch League, both were questioned in this article for Launcher. And I'll quickly summarize the things that were stated here. Monty said that he wanted to make more video content for Owl and that the traditional sports approach that Overwatch League is leaning into full stop doesn't fit for the typical esports fan. And he said Overwatch League is more like the world wrestling entertainment where fans just want to see cool stuff. And what I assume he means is wanting to amp up the hype factor. He's also tweeted about how the old Apex hype videos were really cool. So I would imagine more of like a gaming frag video level of enthusiasm where things are kind of larger than life. That's what I would assume WWE is supposed to mean. But the league wants to go more of a buttoned up, taking things seriously approach that appeals to the traditional sports viewer who normally isn't into video games that might feel a little wacky, right? So a little bit more into where those philosophies have diverged. Monte Cristo also noted that he thought they would have signed on many more casters by this point noting that the travel that would be required of him would basically make 
doing anything else other than Overwatch League, any of the other projects he wanted to do, impossible. There's been a ton of talk about player burnout in the Overwatch League, traveling to country to country, but if there's not enough casting talent, production burnout is going to be a real thing. John Spector also commented that there will be fundamental changes to production in the upcoming Overwatch League season. They'll have teams of casters in regions, and they are hiring new casters that will be announced into the league. And in fact, they might be adding more as the league goes on. Last little snippet for you. Two teams in the Overwatch League went through a rebrand, which will give us new skins. The Florida Mayhem got rid of their ugly McDonald's red and yellow colors and now sport this vibrant hot pink and black aesthetic. They tweeted out in a small paragraph stating that you need to forget what you know about the Florida Mayhem because they're bringing the heat in 2020. Keep in mind that they're actually the worst team in the Overwatch League. A lot of people remember the Season 1 0 40 Shanghai Dragons, but they actually had a decent Season 2, but Mayhem still stayed at the bottom and are overall combined the worst team in the history of Overwatch League. Alongside that, the LA Valiant new logo had already been leaked by the league accidentally, but then the Valiant made this promo video to show off that they are ditching the old green and are instead reworking the Valiant colors to have a yellow and blue look. Blue skies and sunshine. I get it. There's no word on how this will affect skins, but I assume that you'll just have to buy the new versions. I hope they don't replace the old ones. That doesn't really seem to make much sense. Whenever there's a redesign, I would assume they would just make a new variant that you had to spend coins on. Wow, what a packed news video today. That's everything. If you did enjoy the video, please be sure to leave it a like. It really does help us out. Let's know that you're enjoying the content. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the bell icon to actually be notified when our videos go live. Link to the description is our Twitter, where we tweet out news, updates, and dank memes. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. We'll see you guys next time.